A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. First in magazine form in 1912. First printing of a book in 1917. This edition, 1963 from Ballantine Books. It's the authorized edition by the Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporation. Let's first talk about the art from the 1917 edition and this 1963 edition. On the left, you see the cover art by Frank E. Schoonover. This is from the 1917 first edition of A Princess of Mars. To the right, you have the 1963 Ballantine Books cover by Bob Abbott. You'll notice that it's an homage to the original cover. A couple differences between the covers, you'll see that in the clothing, the red and purple are exchanged by the main characters. Also, on the 1963 illustration, you'll notice that we have a vision of Mars with the moons in the sky. A Princess of Mars is a sword and planetary romance novel. It was first serialized in All Story magazine in 1912 from February to July. Edgar Rice Burroughs at the time wasn't very confident about the reception of this novel. Perhaps he was concerned that it might affect his other franchise, Tarzan. In the magazine form, he chose to take a pseudonym, Normal Bean. This was just to say, hey, I'm just a normal person writing this. In the production of the February magazine, there was a typo, and they called him Norman Bean. After its reception in 1912, he returned to his name, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Edgar Rice Burroughs, in the foreword to this novel, tells us how he came upon the manuscript. John Carter is a friend of his father's. They both served in the American Civil War. Years after the war ended, Edgar Rice Burroughs came into possession of this manuscript. Our first person protagonist, then, is John Carter, a Confederate veteran of the American Civil War. Following the war, he went to Arizona prospecting gold. He ran into some trouble with an Apache tribe and flees. Hiding out in a cave, he finds that he is mysteriously transported to Mars. On Mars, due to the gravity, he finds that he has superhuman strength and the ability to leap far distances. This becomes an amazing advantage in the battles to come. We are introduced to a variety of creatures and cultures. We find out that those dwelling on Mars refer to it as Barsoom. There are green Martians and red Martians and white ape-like creatures. John Carter first falls into a tribe of green Martians. These are tall insect-like creatures. To illustrate, I'm going to use some pictures from the movie John Carter 2012. We'll talk about that later. They are sixth limb warriors. They are from a nomadic tribe called Tharks. John Carter's fighting ability due to his superhuman strength on Mars helps him to climb in the rankings of this tribe. He becomes friends with a chieftain, Tars Tarkas. While part of this tribe, there is a battle with some airships from Helium. Yes, Helium. Dea Thoris, a princess of Helium, is captured. She is a red Martian, and red Martians are humanoid. And of course, she's beautiful. She's the princess of Mars. John Carter is smitten. From here we go to many adventures on Mars. There are villains and heroes, wars and love. Wanting to rescue this princess, Carter becomes involved in the political intrigue of the planet. John Carter refers to himself as the gentleman from Virginia. His fighting ability and loyalty to friends help him rise in influence on the planet. World building and adventures continue. Eventually, the Princess of Mars is in the hands of another tribe on Mars. John Carter brings together Green Martians and the Red Martians of Helium in a final battle to regain his love. At the end of the novel, there is a struggle to try to keep the atmosphere of Mars from fading away. John Carter makes a last-ditch attempt to help those trying to fix the great atmosphere machine. As he is facing asphyxiation, he finds himself back in the cave in Arizona. 
Will he be able to return to Mars? We'll find out in book two of the series, The Gods of Mars. This book was written 112 years ago. Its prose is of its time. I can imagine Edgar Rice Burroughs settling down in a leather wingtip chair by a fireplace, perhaps smoking a pipe and saying, hey, gather around, have I got a story for you. Imagine the language of the day from some Victorian novels to H.G. Wells, Arthur Conan Doyle, and that's the kind of language that we have here in this book. We have an amazing mashup of action here. At times it feels like ancient Rome, and then it feels like the dusty deserts of the Old West. There's science fiction elements, like the low gravity giving him superhuman strength, or bullets that are made of radium, which can explode when shattered in sunlight. And finally, there's an atmosphere machine maintaining the shallow atmosphere of Mars. Burroughs is an amazing world builder. The aliens and their customs, their political and sociological intrigue. Burroughs had a way of describing civilizations, the worlds and the creatures and their customs. This is a historically important novel that was an inspiration to many of the writers of the golden age of science fiction. Not only them, but also to scientists and dreamers. It's still a very entertaining read today. I give it 8 out of 10. But that's not all. I want to make a comparison with the 2012 movie John Carter. Let's go screen the movie. You might know the name of Andrew Stanton. He's worked at Pixar from the very first Toy Story movie. One of his most famous directorial turns was with Wally. -E. This film was one of the next films that he made. It came out in 2012, a hundred years after the magazine story. Mars. So you name it and think that you know it. The red planet. No air, no life, but you do not know Mars, for its true name is Barsoom. About a third of the way into the movie and a few thoughts. One, there is a bit of Pixar pixie dust added to this film, mostly in the humor. Two, the earth scenes seem to be very accurate. There's a few additions, but otherwise it really is fairly accurate. And now Mars or Barsoom. You see the Thrax behind me here, and that is Tars Tarkas. Very accurately represented as far as I can tell. Many of the opening scenes for John Carter on Mars are here, and he starts to gain his rank within the Thrax, the green men of Mars. Now the red men of Mars, they're the ones that look like humans. They've advanced the storyline of two cities of red men coming to battle each other. I can understand why they did that. A lot of movies have an A and B storyline that eventually meet together. Dea, the princess of Mars, is a little bit more than just a damsel in distress in this movie. We see her fighting prowess. Now the airships and some of the fighting is a bit too much like some other science fiction movies, I think. And there's an addition of three almost godlike figures. These aren't in the book. They're in the ear of a leader from Zodanga. One of these three godlike beings is actually a reason why John Carter gets to Mars. Of course, that's not in the novel either. There's a medallion that teleports him. I can tell that the movie makers have definitely read the book, and there is a lot of faithful reproductions here. The problem is, most viewers probably haven't read the book, and I'm not sure if it translates well for them. All right, back to the movie. And you fight like a thought. We're about halfway in now, and a lot of society building for the Green Martians, the Tharks, has been just covered in a couple minutes. In fact, there's one big plot reveal 
that is done by the person who should be surprised by this plot detail. Having read the novel, I understand what's going on with the society, but for those who haven't, I think it's going to be very confusing. There's also this introduction of these three godlike figures called therns, and it seems like this is something that perhaps is in further novels in the Mars or Barsoom series. I have only read the first one, so I don't know. On we go. That's Dea, the Princess of Mars. This is one of those godlike beings that's in this story, has the ear of Saab of Zodanga. He is called a Thern. If you've read the rest of this series and know what this is about, please comment. What is that? I don't think I've talked about this guard dog that was supposed to keep John Carter a prisoner at one point, but befriends him and is very loyal to him. It's called Wola. It is incredibly ugly and incredibly fast, but it is very loyal to John Carter. I guess Star Wars has an influence on this picture too. Now some gladiator in the arena. That's it. Back to the library for a few thoughts. Just finished watching John Carter and I have a few thoughts. I think it was needlessly complicated. The Thern godlike characters really played a big role in the conclusion of this movie. These godlike creatures are supposedly immortal. Their origins aren't of our solar system. Some of you well-read Edgar Rice Burroughs fans can tell me, do they appear in any of the other novels? I felt like there was a little bit too much Pixar in this movie as well. Humor and some zany action sequences didn't seem to match my reading of A Princess of Mars. There is definitely an updated version of this princess. She is a scientist and a warrior. There were also a lot of influences from other films. I think if they kept to the novel, this movie could have been good. But there's too much extraneous plot in my mind. No rating, just my thoughts. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of the movie. Until next time, keep reading.